The Atari 2600 is one of the most recognisable video game consoles of all time. It was a dominant force in the home console market during the second generation of consoles and before this, Atari was also destroying the arcades too. In today's video, which is sponsored by G Fuel's Atari 2600 Plus collector's box, link down below, I plan to look into the history of how this company came to be. There's a lot of unknown, unfortunate and downright incorrect information when it comes down to the birth of Atari and some of their more popular first party titles such as Pong, Asteroids and Centipede. And today, again thanks to G Fuel's awesome collector's set which includes four incredible flavours inspired by the 2600 Plus itself, the company's first arcade game Pong and a couple of their more popular titles, those being Asteroids and Centipede 2, which are all housed in this stunning 2600 Plus box with a keychain and unique tumbler which, yes, looks just like a CX40 Plus joystick amazing yep thanks to those guys i'll be looking into the entire origin story of the original 1977 atari 2600 as well as those free games but in order for us to do that exact thing we need to go back to the beginning back to the early 1950s where a young 14 year old Alan Alcorn from San Francisco who was still at junior high school got himself a job at a TV repair shop fixing up burnt out vacuum tubes in TVs. As the years went on Alan continued to hone his electronic repair skills effectively becoming the guy that could fix virtually everything that was sent his way which is how he eventually paid for college. As those college years went on Alan went ahead and got himself a what would be now known as an internship but back then it was was nothing more than a job. A job that allowed him to continue paying for college for the next six months. And the company he worked for during this time was Ampex, a leader in audio tape technology, developing many analog recording formats that remained heavily in use during the 1990s. And as you can imagine, for someone that had spent a heavy portion of their life fixing up TVs and radios, this was right up Alan's street. Working at Ampex gave Alan the drive he needed to not only try harder, but more importantly to create. Create with the small team he was assigned to that included Nolan Bushnell and Ted Dabney. Now Ted was someone that came from the Marine Corps, where he was able to take electronic courses which helped him blag his way into a job at the Bank of America who at the time was one of the world leaders of electronic recording machine accounting. It's essentially automated bank bookkeeping, all of this was very new in the 1950s. Before he moved on to a role at HP and then of course Ampex himself. And as for Nolan Bushnell, well he was someone that after almost burning down his parents garage as a youngster by unsuccessfully creating his own rocket fuel, studied electronic engineering and at the same time was also switching out tubes in broken TV sets himself for a different repair company. All of this before he got himself a job at an arcade at the Lagoon Amusement Park in Salt Lake City. And this was all supposedly because he lost his tuition money in a poker game. Now, when I say arcade, I don't mean the typical retro arcade you're probably thinking of, you know, ones filled with Pac-Man, Space Invaders, and obviously Moonwalker, you know, all the usual arcade staples. Nope, unsurprisingly back then it was very different, as obviously none of these games existed yet. Arcades were filled to the brim with pinball machines, dartboards, loud music and of course plenty of electromechanical machines too, better known in the industry as Elamecas. And back then, he not only learned how to quickly fix these bowling, horse riding, baseball and rifle Elamecas, but he would also need to entice people up to play more typical ring toss carnival like games too. One interesting history piece that I absolutely adore from this part of the story, and it really does go to show what kind of a person that Nolan Bushnell was, was when he would buy up broken old arcade machines from Lagoon Amusement Park, he would fix them up and then put them in frat houses, sharing the profits with the house manager. Mr. Bushnell sure did know how to make money, and as he became more and more interested in mechanical gaming, it wasn't long before he discovered quote-unquote video gaming too. 
In the late 60s, if you wanted to connect a computer up to a telephone or to a video screen, you could only do it in three places, the University of Utah, MIT or Stanford. Nolan Bushnell interview, Next Generation. Luckily for him, Stanford was the college that he attended, and after he too moved to Ampex, he decided to take that small Ampex team back to his college to show them one of the world's first video games, Space War, a game that he had spent the last several years becoming completely addicted to. Now, originally, the plan was to show them this game and then try and work out how they could recreate it and turn it into some sort of Elemecha, but obviously, with a screen and, more importantly, a coin slot. Again, Nolan was always obsessed with trying to find the next ingenious way to make some money. In fact, carnival-type pizza parlors were one of the first business ventures that Bushnell and Dabney had explored. Venues that would be filled to the brim with elemechas and cheap pizza, where people of all ages would love to go and celebrate a grease-filled birthday party. But they soon realized just how expensive that would be. So their sights went back to Space War. I'm sure they'll cover the pizza arcade thing a little later on in the story. It was around this time when Nolan convinced Dabney to try and recreate that Space War game, which is exactly what he did, after kicking out his daughter from her bedroom to sleep in the living room and then turn her living quarters into his Space Wars HQ. It wasn't an easy task, as stated, you could only ever run Space War at three different places around the world, and that was because of its extreme cost to run it. Either way, they did it, and as quick as Dabney could solder down that last diode, Bushnell had already got a contract to make the first true arcade machine, which is exactly what he did. And it was a failure. You see, the problem with Syzygy's computer space, which is the terrible name of their company and the name of their Space War clone, was that it was just too complicated to play. You gotta remember, no one had ever played an arcade game before. Perhaps failure is a bit of a stretch. Sure, it didn't make the money that they expected, but it did sell just over 1,000 units, which still validated Syzygy's belief in the future of arcade games, before the term arcade games had even been mm, coined. Sorry. Now, by this point, as you may have already guessed, Dabney and Bushnell had left Ampex. They were working at Syzygy, their new company, and that company was working with another company called Nutting, who were distributing their Space War clone. But when the computer space didn't meet Nutting's projected expectations, the duo left and then started working on a simpler game, this time contracted by Bally. Yes the pinball people. And because of this, that contract stated that they needed to make a pinball game and a quote-unquote video game too. Dabney went off to create the pinball machine and Bushnell went back to Ampex and got his old team member, Alan Alcorn, to create the video game. The plan was to create a driving video game of some sort, but after playing a demo of the soon-to-be-released Magnavox Odyssey, the first commercially released home video game console, where you control a paddle moving up and down, bouncing a projectile back and forth and back and forth, he decided to get Alcon to basically just recreate that. In his mind, if Alcorn could go off and recreate this game, he could then use this as a starting point to go off and make whatever this driving game would become. And that's what Alcorn did. After two to three months, he created a table tennis-like game that was controlled by two dials that would move paddles up and down, bouncing a square white dot back and forth and back and forth until one side missed. Upon playing this, Dabney instantly knew they had something here. When that dot hit the top of the paddle, it would go up. When it would hit the bottom of the paddle, it would go down, and if it hit the middle, it would go towards the center. This was a true game of skill. It had a score to keep people interested, and it even had very variable speeds too. All it needed now was sound, and after Alcorn went back and added in some bleeps and bloops, well, that was the icing on the cake. <laughs> 
since I was under the impression that this was to be a real product, I worked hard to make it playable and inexpensive. VG Network, Al Alcorn Interview. Now, before carrying on with this video, I think that this is a great place to stop and show off a few of the flavours found within this G Fuel Collector set. First up is Pong's Blue Raspberry, and yes, even though this is a history piece on the original 2600, the other flavour is based on the 2023 released 2600 Plus. And as this is a sponsored video, I'm also obliged to tell you that G Fuel is zero sugar and therefore provides heaps of pure clean energy without the horrendous crash that comes from those horrible knockoff energy drinks that I personally became addicted to a few years back. So again, for me personally, that's great. Okay, so uh, yeah, let's try out some of these flavors. Obviously I would be using this, uh, the Atari Cup, and it is also it's so hard not to constantly move this around like a joystick uh, but to save myself constantly having to clean this up we've got some glasses from around the world and let's start with this one here the Atari 2600 plus flavor which is the red explosive fruit gummy let's try it oh mmm Yeah, I like that. That's nice. That's nice. It's um, tastes very much like, like um, like like penny sweets. I suppose on the same level as, I don't know, kind of like love hearts. I suppose. It's nice. It's nice. I've got a lot to drink. Actually, I'm gonna have a bit more of that one. Yeah, that's nice. Yeah, I like that. I like that. Okay, so that's what. An Atari 2600 Plus tastes like, apparently. <laughs> now, next up, let's have a look. Is it this one? Okay, so we've got Pong here, uh, which is a blue raspberry. Let's give that a go. Okay. That's nice as well. That's good. I mean, this is a sponsored video. <laughs> take, take this from what you want. But what does that taste like? I suppose if you've had other energy drinks that are like that blue flavour, that blue raspberry flavour, I mean, yeah, that's kind of what this tastes like. That's good. I think I'm more of a fan of the Atari 2600 Plus flavour, um, which is a good thing because I've got more servings of that one. Um, but yeah, anyway, there you go. There are those two flavours. Let's carry on with the video and we'll get back to Centipede and Asteroids. Get back to Centipede and Asteroids a little later on in the video. A long night of playing Winner Stays On between the three of them commenced as the trio got better and better at their new game. However, Bushnell, as much fun as it was for him, still wanted a driving game. Thankfully, Dabney convinced him otherwise, continuing to reconfirm that this is fun. It took some convincing, but they eventually wore him down. The only thing left to do was to come up with a name. It started with Ping Pong, of course, and then just Ping, which they decided against, as that's the name of a golf club company, which obviously left Pong. 12 machines were quickly manufactured of the classic game and now under their new company name, Atari, which is a term that came from the popular strategy board game Go, the duo started to send out test units to bars such as Andy Cap's Tavern in California and if the legend is true, shortly after installing that first ever Pong machine, Atari got an angry call from the tavern owner claiming that the machine was broken and that his Patreons were upset because they couldn't play it anymore. And when the engine engineers got to the venue to repair it, it was quickly discovered that the reason for this malfunction was because it was so full of money. And that was the reason the machine stopped working. In other words, Pong was a massive, massive hit. Now, wouldn't it be great if that was true? It's one of gaming's greatest feel-good stories. Um, but the problem is, when I create these videos, I try and go to as many sources as I can to get the correct information. Unfortunately, with the history of Atari, there are quite a few conflicting stories as to what happened, and now it's basically up to you to decide which story is true. 
Because with that in mind, according to the book All Your Base Are Belong To Us by Harold Goldberg, it states that after speaking with Lonnie Reader, who was Bushnell's longtime assistant, that the whole story was faked. And according to her, employees of Atari went to the bar themselves and filled up the machine with a crazy amount of quarters before sitting back and waiting for that bar manager to call and, well, the rest is history. Honestly, I'm happy either way. Was this all just a made up story to raise awareness on Atari's first proper arcade game? Or was this game simply that popular? Well, it doesn't matter either way, because there was no getting away from the fact that just how popular and legendary Pong would eventually become. The entire first generation of video game consoles was pretty much nothing but variations of Pong. And even though technically Atari's edition wasn't the first, similar to Doom in the first person realm, it was so perfect at what it did that everything else, whether it came before it or not, was known the world over as nothing more than Pong clones. And arguably more impressive than all of this was that it ignited the arcade gaming scene. But more importantly for this video, it ignited Atari. There was still some way to go before Atari would become the household name themselves, and even though Pong was very much enjoyed, the patent for the game took so long to clear that before you know it, Pong itself was copied. In fact, it's believed that the original Pong in its various forms only made up for about one third of the Pong-type machines that were out there in the 1970s, which, as you may have guessed, severely undercut the entire Pong clone market as a whole, and of course, by the tail end of the 70s, bored the general public too. In other words, there was about 1,000 variations of Pongs in the arcades, and eventually the same amount in the homes too. Hey, Clint, what are you doing? Playing a little handball. Now there's more to Sears Telegame than just Pong. Hey, Gramps, you want to play some catch? Okay. Now Sears has a whole line of telegames. Hi, Gramps, can I play? Sure. Let's play Super Pong Doubles. And some telegames have remote controls, so up to four people can play a whole variety of games. Hey, that a boy, Scooter, you got it, you got it? Telegames, electronic games, sold only at Sears. Not only did Atari themselves release a Pong home system at Sears under the Telstar name, but it's worth pointing out that even Nintendo had jumped onto the Pong bandwagon with their first ever console, the Color Game 6, in Japan. Pong Doubles, Rebound, Super Pong, Pin Pong. These are not third party clones, these are just some of the official clones, or sequels I suppose, from Atari themselves, who were losing the public's interest more and more with every release. There's no getting away from it. As legendary as Pong was, it was time to move on. Scion Engineering was the company that Nolan had purchased to help make something new, and after they did that exact thing with the buggy mess of a release that was Grand Track 10, which was finally the driving game that Bushnell had always wanted, a game that was accidentally sold for less than it cost to make due to an accounting error, it looked as if the Atari company was on its way out. In a desperate attempt to save his company, Nolan Bushnell, who had now parted ways by this point with Ted Dabney, started setting up short retreats for his engineers filled with booze and marijuana in an attempt to help them relax and hopefully come up with some new ideas. And plenty of fresh ideas came from these sessions, including that earlier mentioned Telstar console, the precursor to Simon, which was Atari's Touch Me. Yes, Simon was a stolen idea too. and even an arcade game that included a rifle where you would shoot ducks a whole decade before Nintendo did the same thing on the NES. One of the more impressive things that Nolan did during this time was to form yet another company called Key Games. It was named after his neighbour called Joe Keenan, and Joe Keenan was the manager of that company. However, the connection between the two was done in secret, and was done to get around exclusivity deals held by arcade owners, as well as giving Atari control over some of the clones that Key Games would secretly produce. You see, whilst Atari were struggling to come up with new game ideas that would be on the same level as Pong, Key Games were doing great, selling Pong clones and then giving that money back 
to Atari. It got so good for key games that they even eventually started making a few games of their own, including Tank. Tank was one of the games made by the company and was just simply so popular that it did what Atari was struggling to do. It saved the company. And it was partly because of this that Atari knew better than they ever did before that video games, good video games, were going to be the company's strong points. Just as long as they were good. Because of this, that chilled out booze and drug filled party like nature became even more commonplace at Atari so that they could come up with these new fantastical and fresh ideas. Before you know it, word would spread and Atari became known as a pretty awesome place to work with its motto, work hard and party harder. The following years were great for Atari. They pumped out some real stonkers. Arcade gaming was alive and Atari was leading the way. However, one thing bugged Bushnell, and that was the cost of making these games. Spending upwards of $100,000 to produce and manufacture just one game that more often than not was old news a few months later. Because of this, Cyan Engineering, who was now a subsidiary of Atari, started working on another home system that would allow for interchangeable games as early as 1975. The problem was that chips like the Motorola 68000, which would have been the best to use for this project, cost roughly $100 each and therefore would have been way too expensive for the general public. Thankfully, in September of that same year, Chuck Peddle, a former employee of Motorola, made a deal with Scion to sell his newly designed MOS6502 microprocessors for only $8 a piece, and with that, they finally had what they needed to work on the Atari VCS, then known simply as Stella, named after a bicycle one of the guys was riding. As time moved on, it was apparent that Atari was going all in on this new reprogrammable console. They ended up moving the team that were working on it over to California to work directly with the Atari R&D team. It was all systems go. Over time, that 6502 got replaced with an even cheaper chip, the 6507, and before you know it, it was evident that Atari was once again running out of money. Tank and most definitely Pong by this point, along with all of their sequels, were simply just not bringing in the money needed to keep this thing afloat. Add that with the fact that the Fairchild Channel F system had just been released, which was the first ever console that allowed the player to change games with ROM cartridges, and Nolan Bushnell was, once again, panicking. He was almost out of money, and now his stellar project was no longer first to market. Because of this, he reached out to Warner, who at the time were looking for new ventures as their 7-inch record sales had been declining for many years. And before you know it, Atari was sold to Warner for $28 million, and as soon as the acquisition was complete, $100 million instantly got injected into finishing Stella. It was very much a match made in heaven. Atari's rock and roll nature were now being looked after by a, well, predominantly a rock and roll music company. And then in 1977, Stella was finally released under the new name, the Atari Video Computer System, better known as the Atari VCS. And I mean, it did all right. The Atari Video Computer System is 20 cartridges with 1300 game variations you play on your own TV set. Don't watch television tonight, play it. Surprisingly, out of the gate, the Atari VCS wasn't the runaway success that Bushnell and Warner had predicted in those early days. Sure, it stood out amongst the competitors, but again, the majority of its games were not too far away from Tank and Pong games, which, as great as they were, they were old news. Atari needed a new killer app, and as more and more programmers jumped on board, they continued to look for said app. Eventually, that so-called app did come in 1978, although it wouldn't affect the Atari VCS until 1980. The arcade phenomenon that was Space Invaders was that game, but of course, in those early years, it was still an arcade exclusive. And before it single-handedly tripled the sales of Atari's home console, just like every successful game before it, it spawned a whole heap of copycats and space-themed games. One of which was, of course, the 1979 classic Asteroids. 
Again, originally starting its life in the arcades, Asteroids is a game where you dodge and shoot down, well, asteroids that float about in a wraparound screen until you take them all down. And it was a massive, massive hit for Atari in the arcades. Unsurprisingly, the game was heavily inspired by the earlier mentioned computer space game and a stated Space Invaders. And just like the oscilloscope that displayed earlier versions of Space War, Asteroids was also designed in the arcades to use vector graphics too. It truly was a sight to behold, and like all vector-based arcade games, it just can't be replicated even to this day, even on the highest end video game console. If you're ever in a retro arcade, make sure you do yourself a favour and go and check out one of these games like Asteroids. In fact, this game was so popular that it did the unthinkable. By 1980, Asteroids had taken over Space Invaders as the dominant arcade game, making it Atari's best-selling arcade game of all time. Thankfully, that same year, Space Invaders did come back in a big way, but this time in the homes on the Atari VCS, making that console a household name. And only one year later, Asteroids also hit the console and was once again a massive seller for the now dominant force. In fact, Asteroids for the Atari VCS for the time was also quite legendary. It was one of the first games ever for the system to use bank switching, a technique that increases the ROM size from 4 kilobytes to a whopping 8 kilobytes. The only sad thing about all of this was that Nolan Bushnell had already left the company by the time all of this had blown up, as he was looking into ventures new. Remember that old carnival pizza idea he had before Pong was even a thing? Well, when Warner took over Atari, whilst they were looking around at what they could acquire, Noland opened up the first ever Chuck E. Cheese in 1977. But when the company refused to open up anymore, he bought the rights off them, left the company and, well, that's a story for another time. And I think that's a good place to stop. So in the War of the Worlds Cup, which you can't really see because this is a very dark color, we have one that I made way too much of. <laughs> I don't know how much energy drink I'm supposed to be drinking tonight, but yeah. This is the Asteroids flavor. The actual flavor is sour grape. Sour grape. Um, yeah, that's what Asteroids tastes like, apparently. So let's uh, give this a go. Oh, wow. Okay, that's my favorite flavor. Oh, I could drink that. I could drink a lot of that. That's that's nice. Um, sour grape. I don't know how else to, take, to explain the taste. It's kind of what I expected. That's really nice. That, that's a good one. I really like that. That's the best one. Anyway, let's move on to uh, the final one on here. Uh, which also may be my favorite actually uh, the centipede flavor which is strawberry pineapple and coconut let's have a look uh, in Carsland from california let's have a look oh no that's that's the best one that is the best so it goes like this that is that is without a doubt a best that, that tastes like a a really good high quality fruit juice um, sort of mixed flavors that you get you know like those smoothie mixes that's really nice I could drink that one all day long so you've got first place second place third place and that was my favorite for a while and then fourth place uh, and th I mean they're all good um, but yeah this this one's beautiful mmm that is what Centipede, Asteroids, Pong, and the Atari 2600 Plus taste like. Thank you, G Fuel, for sponsoring this video. I'm um, not going to keep you guys any longer than this. Um, there are links down below, all that jazz as described. But for now, let's carry on with this video. If you guys want to get this, there it is right there. It's an awesome box set, an amazing collector set for any Atari 2600 and 2600 Plus fan. Um, yeah, this is awesome. Thank you, guys. Uh, let's carry on with the video. 
Centipede once again started its life in the arcades and was partly created by Ed Logg from Asteroid fame and Connor Bailey, one of gaming's first ever female superstars. Now, in all fairness, she wasn't the first female full-time video game designer. That honor is believed to have gone to Carol Shaw, who also worked at Atari and created the game Tic-Tac-Toe for the VCS, but still, it's quite the achievement. Upon arriving at the company, Donna looked over a notebook of game ideas, most of which were heavily space and shooting themed. Thanks, Asteroids. However, when looking over, she did see one game design where you would shoot bugs. She thought to herself, it doesn't seem bad to shoot bugs, so she went with that. It was this different approach to game making that would ultimately make Centipede stand out against the competition. Working similar to Space Invaders to a degree, a game that inspired Donna to create games in the first place, you take control of the bug blaster at the bottom of the screen and shoot up through a mushroom filled playfield in order to take down the centipede that is bouncing back and forth and back and forth towards you with great speed. If you shoot the head of the centipede, it will get smaller, but if you shoot the center, the centipede splits it's in half, forcing you to fight against multiple centipedes at the same time. And if that wasn't unique enough, after testing the game with buttons, similar to Ed Logg's Asteroids game, she quickly discovered that buttons and eventually a joystick was just not the best way to go about controlling the bug blaster. Countless hours of testing brought with it the trackball, which was perfect for a quick game like this. Add that with the theme and pastel-like colors that Centipede is known for, and what you have is a title that not only stands out, but attracts one of the biggest demographics since Pong itself. Centipede became one of the best-selling arcade games for Atari ever released, and has now become a staple of the golden age of arcade games, going up alongside things like Frogger, Pac-Man, and of course, Donkey Kong. Atari were a force to be reckoned with, not only in the arcades, which was a pretty tough fight for them to be fair, but as the competition grew in those sweaty, grimy, and of course now those cheap pizza-filled venues, the home market was completely dominated by Atari, and the vast, vast majority of that competition in the arcades did eventually find their way into the home onto the company's now rebranded Atari 2600 video computer system, better known these days as simply the 2600. Thank you once again to Atari and G Fuel for supporting the channel and allowing me to make this not so short history piece. Once again, if you want to go get yourself the Atari 2600 Plus collector set from G Fuel, links can be found down below. Once again, that set includes 40 servings of Atari 2600 Plus, red explosive fruit gummy flavor, and 15 servings of Pong's Blue Raspberry, Asteroid Sour Grape, and Centipede's Strawberry, Pineapple, and Coconut Energy Tubs. Add that with the incredible display box, the 24-ounce double-walled stainless steel CX40 Plus joystick tumbler, and the Atari system keychain, and what you've got is one seriously cool set. <laughs> Here we go. Awesome. <laughs> Beautiful. Three out of this world games from Atari, the number one video computer system with more games than any other. Everyone's gone Atari, the number one video game. And as stated, thank you G Fuel for sponsoring this video and allowing me to make this history piece on Atari. I really, really enjoyed uh, looking into the history of Atari and I'm really proud on how the video turned out. Thank you guys so, so much. If you guys want to check out the Atari 2600 Plus collector's box, there's a link down below. It's not a uh, affiliate link or anything like that, but it does tell them that fans of the show are actually clicking that link. So go and check it out. It really does help the show. Uh, if you guys go and check that out. Thank you so, so much. Um, but yeah, on top of that, let's also give a massive shout out to all of the Patreons and the YouTube members that allow me to make videos every single month. With an extra big shout out going to uh, Boots and Bup, The Sneaky Ferret, Vetus Varnas, James, The Action Saxon, uh, Roll VP, Jay's Manchild. 
Clan Pop, Mike Fallon, Nicholas Burtner, Chev Matic, Jabba Al Aiden, uh, Benjamin Guy, Richard Aldegic, Shadow Dragon, Wobbles and Bean, The Wonder Ducks, Dina, Ye Old Hamburglar, Jeff Mianowski, Bram Perez, Conrad Constantine, um, Andrew Dalton, Retro to Next Gen, aka Lou, Paul Float, Ryan Burford, Casey Samples, VPS Data, Sir Nilsson, Stephen, Derekuda, Akatimo84, John Rogers, Matt Jackson, Ian Quell, Arista, Dina81, Mind of the Unsane, and Vike Echo. I didn't put it in alphabetical order and it threw me off. Look, thank you guys for supporting the show for as long as you have. I really, really do appreciate it. If you guys want to get your name shown uh, that you see like down there on the bottom of the screen, plus see videos like this early, I think this one went up like almost a month early for Patreons uh, and YouTube members, then yeah, links are down below. Anyway, thank you guys for supporting the show. For supporting the show. This is DJ Slope signing out and hopefully I'll see you all next time. Bye-bye. Thank you.